It was a battered old book bound in red buckram. He found it when he was twelve years old on an upper shelf in his father's library, and against all the rules he took it to his bedroom to read by candlelight, when the rest of the rambling Elizabethan house was flooded with darkness. That was how young Mortimer always thought of it. His own room was a little isolated cell in which, with stolen candle ends, he could keep the surrounding darkness at bay, while everyone else had surrendered to sleep and allowed the outer night to come flooding in. By contrast with those unconscious ones, his elders, it made him feel intensely alive in every nerve and fibre of his young brain. The ticking of the grandfather clock in the hall below, the beating of his own heart, the long-drawn rhythmical ah of the sea on the distant coast, all filled him with a sense of overwhelming mystery. And as he read, the soft thud of a blinded moth striking the wall above the candle would make him start and listen like a creature of the woods at the sound of a cracking twig. The battered old book had the strangest fascination for him, though he never quite grasped the thread of the story. It was called The Midnight Express, and there was one illustration on the fiftieth page at which he could never bear to look. It frightened him. Young Mortimer never understood the effect of that picture on him. He was an imaginative but not neurotic youngster, and he avoided that fiftieth page as he might have hurried past a dark corner on the stairs when he was six years old, or as the grown man on the lonely road in the ancient mariner, who, having once looked round, walks on and turns no more his head. There was nothing in the picture, apparently, to account for this haunting dread. Darkness, indeed, was almost its chief characteristic. It showed an empty railway platform, at night lit by a single dreary lamp, an empty railway platform that suggested a deserted and lonely junction in some remote part of the country. There was only one figure on the platform, the dark figure of a man, standing almost directly under the lamp, with his face turned away toward the black mouth of a tunnel, which, for some strange reason, plunged the imagination of the child into a pit of horror. The man seemed to be listening. His attitude was tense, expectant, as though he were awaiting some fearful tragedy. There was nothing in the text so far as the child could read and could understand to account for this waking nightmare. He could neither resist the fascination of the book nor face that picture in the stillness and loneliness of the night. He pinned it down to the page facing it with two large pins so that he should not come upon it by accident. Then he determined to read the whole story through. But always before he came to page 50 he fell asleep and the outlines of what he had read were blurred and the next night he had to begin again, and again before he came to the fiftieth page, he fell asleep. He grew up and forgot all about the book and the picture. But halfway through his life, at that strange and critical time when Dante entered the dark wood, leaving the direct path behind him, he found himself, a little before midnight, waiting for a train at a lonely junction. And... As the station clock began to strike twelve, he remembered. Remembered like a man waking from a long dream. There, under the single dreary lamp on the long glimmering platform, was the dark and solitary figure that he knew. Its face was turned away from him toward the black mouth of the tunnel. It seemed to be listening, tense, expectant, just as it had been thirty-eight years ago. But he was not frightened now as he had been in childhood. He would go up to that solitary figure, confront it, and see the face that had so long been hidden, so long averted from him. He would walk up quietly and make some excuse for talking to it. He would ask it, for instance, if the train was going to be late. It should be easy for a grown man to do this. But his hands were clenched when he took the first step, as if he too were tense and expectant. Quietly, but with the old vague instincts awakening, he went toward the dark figure under the lamp, 
passed it, swung round abruptly to speak to it, and saw, without speaking, without being able to speak, it was himself staring back, as in some mocking mirror, his own eyes alive in his own white face, looking into his own eyes, alive. The nerves of his heart tingled as though their own electric currents would paralyze it. A wave of panic went through him. He turned, gasped, stumbled, broke into a blind run, out through the deserted and echoing ticket office, onto the long moonlit road behind the station. The whole countryside seemed to be utterly deserted. The moonbeams flooded it with the loneliness of their own deserted satellite. He paused for a moment and heard, like the echo of his own footsteps, the stumbling run of something that followed over the wooden floor within the ticket office. Then he abandoned himself shamelessly to his fear and ran, sweating like a terrified beast, down the long white road between the two endless lines of ghostly poplars, each answering another, into what seemed an infinite distance. On each side of the road there was a long, straight canal in which one of the lines of poplars was again endlessly reflected. He heard the footsteps echoing behind him. They seemed to be slowly but steadily gaining upon him. A quarter of a mile away, he saw a small white cottage by the roadside, a white cottage with two dark windows and a door that somehow suggested a human face. He thought to himself that if he could reach it in time, he might find shelter and security, escape. The thin, implacable footsteps echoing his own were still some way off, when he lurched, gasping, into the little porch, rattled the latch, thrust at the door, and found it locked against him. There was no bell or knocker. He pounded on the wood with his fists until his knuckles bled. The response was horribly slow. At last, he heard heavier footsteps within the cottage. Slowly, they descended the creaking stair. Slowly, the door was unlocked. A tall, shadowy figure stood before him, holding a lighted candle in such a way that he could see little either of the holder's face or form. But to his dumb horror, there seemed to be a cerecloth wrapped around the face. No words passed between them. The figure beckoned him in. As he obeyed, it locked the door behind him. Then, beckoning him again without a word, the figure went before him up the crooked stair, with the ghostly candle casting huge and grotesque shadows on the whitewashed walls and ceiling. They entered an upper room in which there was a bright fire burning with an armchair on either side of it and a small oak table on which there lay a battered old book bound in dark red buckram. It seemed as though the guest had been long expected and all things were prepared. The figure pointed to one of the armchairs, placed the candlestick on the table by the book, for there was no other light but that of the fire, and withdrew without a word, locking the door behind him. Mortimer looked at the candlestick. It seemed familiar. The smell of the guttering wax brought back the little room in the old Elizabethan house. He picked up the book with trembling fingers. He recognized it at once, though he had long forgotten anything about the story. He remembered the ink stain on the title page, and then with a shock of recollection, he came on the fiftieth page, which he had pinned down in childhood. The pins were still there. He touched them again, the very pins which his trembling childish fingers had used so long ago. He turned now to the beginning. He was determined to read it to the end now and discover what it was all about. He felt that it must all be set down there in print, and though in childhood he could not understand it, he would be able to fathom it now. It was called The Midnight Express, and as he read the first paragraph, it began to dawn upon him slowly, fearfully, inevitably, it was the story of a man who in childhood long ago had chanced upon a book in which there was a picture that frightened him. He had grown up and forgotten it, and one night upon a lonely railway platform he had found himself in the remembered scene of that picture. He had confronted the solitary figure under the lamp, recognized it, and fled in panic. 
He had taken shelter in a wayside cottage and had been led to an upper room, found the book awaiting him, and had begun to read it right through to the very end at last. And this book too was called The Midnight Express, and it was the story of a man who in childhood it would go on forever and forever and forever. There was no escape. But when the story came to the wayside cottage for the third time, a deeper suspicion began to dawn upon him. Slowly, fearfully, inevitably. Although there was no escape, he could at least try to grasp more clearly the details of the strange circle, the fearful wheel in which he was moving. There was nothing new about the details. They had been there all the time, but he had not grasped their significance. That was all the strange and dreadful being that had led him up the crooked stair. Who and what was that? The story mentioned something else that had escaped him. The strange host who had given him shelter was about his own height. Could it be that he also... And was this why the face was hidden? At the very moment when he asked himself that question, he heard the click of the key in the locked door. The strange host was entering, moving toward him from behind, casting a grotesque shadow larger than human on the white walls in the guttering candlelight. It was there, seated on the other side of the fire facing him, with a horrible nonchalance as a woman might prepare to remove a veil. It raised its hands to unwind the sear cloth from its face. He knew to whom it would belong, but would it be dead or living? There was no way but one. As Mortimer plunged forward and seized the tormentor by the throat, his own throat was gripped with the same brutal force. The echoes of their strangled cry were indistinguishable, and when the last confused sounds died out together, the stillness of the room was so deep that you might have heard the ticking of the old grandfather clock and the long-drawn rhythmical <sighs> of the sea on a distant coast 38 years ago. But Mortimer had escaped at last. Perhaps after all, he had caught the Midnight Express. It was a battered old book bound in red buckram. Mr. Spalner put his hands over his face. There was the feeling of movement in space, the beautifully tortured scream, the impact and tumbling of the car with wall through wall, over and down like a toy, and him hurled out of it. Then silence. The crowd came running. Faintly where he lay, he heard them running. Where the crowd came from, he didn't know. He struggled to remain aware, and then the crowd faces hemmed in upon him, hung over him like the large glowing leaves of down-bent trees. How swiftly a crowd comes, he thought, like the iris of an eye compressing in out of nowhere. A siren, a police voice, movement. Blood trickled from his lips, and he was being moved into an ambulance. Someone said, is he dead? And someone else said, no, he's not dead. And the third person said, he won't die, he's not going to die. And he saw the faces of the crowd beyond him in the night, and he knew by their expressions that he wouldn't die. And that was strange. He saw a man's face, thin, bright, pale. The man swallowed and bit his lips, very sick. There was a small woman, too, with red hair and too much red on her cheeks and lips. And a little boy with a freckled face. Others' faces, an old man with a wrinkled upper lip, an old woman with a mole upon her chin. They had all come from where? Out of alleys and out of hotels and out of streetcars, and seemingly out of nowhere they came. The crowd looked at him, and he looked back at them and did not like them at all. There was a vast wrongness to them. He couldn't put his finger on it. They were far worse than this machine-made thing that happened to him now. The ambulance doors slammed. Through the windows he saw the crowd looking in, looking in. 
that crowd that always came so fast, so strangely first, to form a circle, to peer down, to probe, to gawk, to question, to point, to disturb, to spoil the privacy of a man's agony by their frank curiosity. The car wheels spun in his mind for days, one wheel, four wheels spinning and whirring around and around. He knew it was wrong. Something wrong with the wheels and the whole accident and the running of feet and the curiosity. The crowd faces mixed and spun into the wild rotation of the wheels. He awoke. How do you feel? asked the doctor. The wheels faded away. Mr. Spawner looked around. Fine, I guess. He tried to find words about the accident. Doctor? Yeah? Do accidents make people, well, a little off? Temporarily, sometimes. He lay staring up at the doctor. Does it hurt your time sense? Panic sometimes does. Makes a minute seem like an hour, or maybe an hour seem like a minute. Yes. Let me tell you, then. The crowd got there too quickly. Thirty seconds after the smash, they were all standing over me and staring at me. It's not right they should run that fast so late at night. You only think it was thirty seconds, said the doctor. It was probably three or four minutes. Your senses... Yeah, I know. My senses. The accident. But I was conscious. I remember one thing that puts it all together and makes it funny. God, so damn funny. The wheels of my car upside down. The wheels were still spinning when the crowd got there. The front wheels. Wheels don't spin very long. Friction cuts them down. And these were really spinning. Oh, you're confused, said the doctor. I'm not confused. That street was empty. Not a soul in sight. And then the accident and the wheels still spinning and all those faces over me. Quick, in no time. And the way they looked down at me, I knew I wouldn't die. Simple shock, said the doctor, walking away into the sunlight. I seem to have a penchant for accidents, he said in his office two weeks later. It was late afternoon. His friend sat across the desk from him listening. I got out of hospital this morning, and first thing on the way home, we detoured round a wreck. There was a crowd. Ah, Things run in cycles, said Morgan. But it was funny, you must admit. I must admit. Now, how about a drink? They talked on for half an hour or more. All the while they talked, at the back of Spalding's brain, a small watch ticked. A watch that never needed winding. It was the memory of a few little things, wheels and faces. At about 5.30, there was a hard metal noise in the street. Morgan nodded and looked out and down. What I tell you? Cycles. A truck and a cream-colored Cadillac. Spawner walked to the window. He was very cold, and as he stood there, he looked at his watch, at the small second hand. One, two, three, four, five seconds. People running. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. From all over, people came running. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen seconds. More people, more cars, more horns blowing. Curiously distant, Spolner looked upon the scene as an explosion in reverse. The fragments of the detonation sucked back to the point of impulsion. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one seconds, and the crowd was there. Spolner made a gesture down at them, wordless. The crowd had gathered so fast. He saw a woman's body a moment before the crowd swallowed it up. Spolner was out of the door, Morgan after him, and down the stairs as rapidly as possible. Come along, hurry. Take it easy. You're not a well man. They walked out under the street. Spolner pushed his way forward. He thought he saw a red-headed woman with too much red color on her cheeks and lips. There, he said wildly to Morgan. Did you see her? S see who? Oh, damn it, she's gone. The crowd closed in. He saw another familiar face. A little freckled boy ran away and vanished among the people. Is she dead? A voice asked. Is she dead? She's dying, someone else replied. She'll be dead before the ambulance arrives. They shouldn't have moved her. They shouldn't have moved her. 
all the crowd faces, familiar yet unfamiliar, bending over, looking down, looking down. Spawner came back out, and Morgan caught hold of him before he fell. They moved her, Morgan. Someone moved her. You should never move a traffic victim. It kills them. It kills them. Yeah, that's the way with people, the idiots. Spawner arranged the newspaper clippings carefully. Morgan looked at them. What's the idea? Ever since your accident, you think every traffic scramble is part of you. What are these? Clippings of motor car crack-ups and photos. I hired a clipping service while I was in hospital to go back through the newspapers. Look at them. Not at the cars, said Spawner, but at the crowds around the cars. He pointed. Here. This woman is in both pictures. Ten years apart. Coincidence. The woman happened to be there once in 1976 and once in 1986. A coincidence, maybe. But twelve times over a period of ten years? When the accidents occurred as much as three miles from one another? Oh, no. Here. He dealt out a dozen photographs. She's in all of these. And why does she wear the same clothes and pictures taken over a period of a decade? I'll be damned, so she does. And why was she standing over me the night of my accident two weeks ago? They had a drink. Morgan went over the files. What does all this add up to? I don't know, said Spolna, except that there's a universal law about accidents. Crowds gather. They always gather. And like you and me, people have wondered year after year why they gathered so quickly, and how. I know the answer. Here it is. He flung the clippings down. It frightens me. They always show up together. At a fire or an explosion or on the sidelines of war, at any public demonstration of this thing called death. Vultures, hyenas, or saints. I don't know which they are. I just don't know. But I'm going to the police with it this evening. It has gone on long enough. One of them shifted that woman's body today. They shouldn't have touched her. It killed her. He placed the clippings in a briefcase. Morgan got up and slipped into his coat. Spawner clicked the briefcase shut. Oh, I just happened to think. What? Maybe they wanted her dead. Spolner took it slow driving downtown. He was rather shocked, but not surprised somehow, when the truck came rolling out of an alley straight at him. He was just congratulating himself on his keen sense of observation and talking out what he would say to the police in his mind when the truck smashed into the car Morgan had lent him. He was forced back and forth in several lightning jerks. Then all motion stopped, and only pain filled him up. He heard their feet running and running and running. He fumbled with the car door. It clicked. He fell out upon the pavement drunkenly and lay ear to the asphalt, listening to them coming. It was like a great rainstorm, with many drops, heavy, light and medium, touching the earth. Weakly, expectantly, he rode his head up and looked. The crowd was there. He tried to move and he realized something was wrong with his spine. He hadn't felt much at the impact, but his spine was hurt. He didn't dare move. Someone said, Give me a hand. We'll roll him over and lift him into a more comfortable position. Spolner's brain burst apart. No, don't move me. You idiots, you'll kill me. Don't. Hands took hold of him. They started to lift him. He cried out, and nausea choked him up. They straightened him out into a ramrod of agony. Two men did it. One of them was thin, bright, pale, alert, a young man. The other man was very old and had a wrinkled upper lip. A familiar voice said, Is he dead? Another voice, a memorable voice, responded, No, not yet, but he will be dead before the ambulance arrives. They were all around him, these judges and jurors with the faces he had seen before. Through his pain, he counted their faces. The freckled boy, the red-haired, red-cheeked woman, an old woman with a mole on her chin. I know what you're here for, he thought. 
You are here just as you are at all accidents, to make certain the right ones live and the right ones die. That's why you lifted me. You knew it would kill. You knew I'd live if you left me alone. And that's the way it's been since time began when crowds gather. You murder much easier this way. Your alibi is very simple. You didn't know it was dangerous to move a hurt man. You didn't mean to hurt him. Who are you? Where do you come from? And how do you get here so soon? You're the crowd that's always in the way, using up good air that a dying man's lungs are in need of, using up space he should be using to lie in alone, tramping on people to make sure they die. That's you. I know all of you. Eyes inverted over him, faces. Somewhere a siren. The ambulance was coming. But looking at the faces, the construction, the cast, the form of the faces, Spolner saw it was too late. He read it in their faces. They knew. He tried to speak. A little bit got out. It looks like I'll be joining up with you. I guess I'll be a member of your group now. He closed his eyes, then waited for the coroner. Craven came out past the Achilles statue in the thin summer rain. It was only just after lighting up time, but already the cars were lined up all the way to the Marble Arch, and the sharp, acquisitive faces peered out ready for a good time with anything possible which came along. Craven went bitterly by with the collar of his Macintosh tight around his throat. It was one of his bad days. All the way up the park he was reminded of passion. But you needed money for love. All that a poor man could get was lust. Love needed a good suit, a car, a flat somewhere, or a good hotel. It needed to be wrapped in cellophane. He was aware all the time of the stringy tie beneath the Macintosh and the frayed sleeves. He carried his body about with him like something he hated. There were moments of happiness in the British Museum reading room, but the body called him back. He bore as his only sentiment the memory of ugly deeds committed on park chairs. People talked as if the body died too soon. That wasn't the trouble to Craven at all. He remembered a dream he had woken three times trembling from. He had been alone in the huge, dark, cavernous burying ground of all the world. Every grave was connected to another under the ground. The globe was honeycombed for the sake of the dead, and on each occasion of dreaming he had discovered anew the horrifying fact that the body doesn't decay. There are no worms and dissolution. Under the ground the world was littered with masses of dead flesh ready to rise again, with their warts and boils and eruptions. He had lain in bed and remembered, as tidings of great joy, that the body, after all, was corrupt. He came into the Edgware Road walking fast. The guardsmen were out in couples, great, languid, elongated beasts, the bodies like worms in their tight trousers. He hated them, and hated his hatred, because he knew what it was, envy. He was aware that every one of them had a better body than himself. Indigestion creased his stomach. He felt sure that his breath was foul. But who could he ask? Sometimes he secretly touched himself here and there with scent. It was one of his ugliest secrets. Why should he be asked to believe in the resurrection of this body he wanted to forget? Sometimes he prayed at night. A hint of religious belief was lodged in his breast like a worm in a nut that his body, at any rate, should never rise again. He knew all the side streets around the Edgware Road only too well. When a mood was on, he simply walked until he was tired, squinting at his own image in the windows of Salmon and Gluckstein and the ABCs. So he noticed at once the posters outside the disused theatre in Kalpa Road. 
The theatre had been built in 1920 by an optimist who thought the cheapness of the site would more than counterbalance its disadvantage of lying a mile outside the conventional theatre zone. But no play had ever succeeded, and it was soon left to gather rat holes and spider webs. The covering of the seats was never renewed, and all that ever happened to the place was the temporary false life of an amateur play or a trade show. Craven stopped and read, The Home of the Silent Film. The first season of Primitives was announced, a highbrow phrase. There would never be a second. Well, the seats were cheap, and it was perhaps worth a shilling to him, now that he was tired, to get in somewhere out of the rain. Craven bought a ticket and went into the darkness of the stalls. In the dead darkness, a piano tinkled something monotonously recalling Mendelssohn. He sat down in a gangway seat and could immediately feel the emptiness all around him. On the screen, a large woman in a kind of toga wrung her hands, then wobbled with curious jerky movements towards a couch. Sometimes she seemed to dissolve altogether into dots and flashes and wiggly lines. A subtitle said, Pompilia, betrayed by her lover Augustus, seeks an end to her troubles. Craven began at last to see. A dim waste of stalls. There were not twenty people in the place. A few couples whispering with their heads touching, and a number of lonely men like himself, wearing the same uniform of the cheap Macintosh. They lay about at intervals like corpses, and again Craven's obsession returned. The toothache of horror. He thought miserably, I am going mad. Other people don't feel like this. Even a disused theatre reminded him of those interminable caverns where the bodies were waiting for resurrection. A slave to his passion, Augustus calls for yet more wine. A gross middle-aged Teutonic actor lay on an elbow with his arm round a large woman in a shift. The spring song tinkled ineptly on and the screen flickered like indigestion. Somebody felt his way through the darkness, scrabbling past Craven's knees, a small man. Craven experienced the unpleasant feeling of a large beard brushing his mouth. There was a long sigh as the newcomer found the next chair, and on the screen events had moved with such rapidity that Pompilia had already stabbed herself, or so Craven supposed, and lay still and buxom among her weeping slaves. A low, breathless voice sighed out close to Craven's ear. What's happened? Is she asleep? Uh, no, dead. Murdered? The voice asked with keen interest. I, I, I don't think so. Uh, stabbed herself. Nobody said hush. Nobody was enough interested to object to a voice. They drooped among the empty chairs in attitudes of weary inattention. The film wasn't nearly over yet, but the small bearded man in the next seat seemed to be interested only in Pompilia's death. The fact that he had come in at that moment apparently fascinated him. Craven heard the word coincidence twice, and he went on talking to himself about it in low, out-of-breath tones. <laughs> Absurd when you come to think of it. And then, no blood at all. Craven didn't listen. He sat with his hands clasped between his knees, facing the fact that he was in danger of going mad. He had to pull himself up, take a holiday, see a doctor. God knew what infection moved in his veins. He became aware that his bearded neighbor had addressed him directly. What? He asked impatiently. What, what, what did you say? There, there will be more blood than you could imagine. What are you talking about? When the man spoke to him, he sprayed him with damp breath. There was a little bubble in his speech like an impediment. He said, when you murder a man... This was a woman, Craven said impatiently. That wouldn't make any difference. It has got nothing to do with murder anyway. And that doesn't signify. They seem to have got into an absurd and meaningless wrangle in the dark. I know, you see, the little bearded man said in a tone of enormous conceit. Do what? About such things? he said with guarded ambiguity. Craven turned and tried to see him clearly. Was he mad? Was this a warning of what he might become, babbling incomprehensibly to strangers in cinemas? He thought, by God, no. Trying to see, I'll be sane yet, I will be sane. He could make out nothing but a small black hump of a body. The man was talking to himself again. He said, talk, mm, such talk. That's say it was all for fifty pounds, that's a lie, it's reasons and reasons. 
They always take the first reason, never look behind thirty years of reasons. Such <laughs> simple things. So this was madness. So long as he could realize that, he must be sane himself, relatively speaking. Not so sane, perhaps, as the seekers in the park or the guardsmen in the Edgware Road, but saner than this. It was like a message of encouragement as the piano tinkled on. Then again, the little man turned and sprayed him. Kill, killed herself, you say, but who's to know that? Not a mere question of what hand holds the knife. He laid a hand suddenly and confidingly on Craven's. It was damp and sticky. Craven said with horror as a possible meaning came to him, What are you talking about? I, I know, the little man said. A man in my position gets to know almost everything. What is your position? Craven said, feeling the sticky hand on his trying to make up his mind whether he was being hysterical or not. After all, there were a dozen explanations. It might be treacle. A pretty <laughs> desperate one, you would say. Sometimes the voice almost died in the throat altogether. The little man began to titter knowingly. He was talking to himself again. It would have been easy to ignore him altogether if it had not been for those sticky hands which he now removed. He seemed to be fumbling at the seat in front of him. His head had a habit of lolling sideways, like an idiot child's. He said distinctly and irrelevantly, Bayswater tragedy. What was that? Craven said sharply. He'd seen those words on a poster before he entered the park. Huh? About the tragedy. <laughs> to think they call Cullen Mews Bayswater. <laughs> Suddenly the little man began to cough. Turning his face towards Craven and coughing right at him, it was like vindictiveness. The voice said brokenly, <coughs> Let me see. <laughs> my umbrella. He was getting up. You didn't have an umbrella. My, my, my umbrella. He repeated, my, and he seemed to lose the word altogether. He went scrabbling out past Craven's knees. Craven let him go. But before he had reached the billowy, dusty curtains of the exit, the screen went blank and bright. The film had broken, and somebody immediately turned up one dirt-choked chandelier above the circle. It shone down just enough for Craven to see the smear on his hands. This wasn't hysteria. This was a fact. He wasn't mad. He had sat next to a madman who in some muse, what, what was the name, Colin, Colin? Craven jumped up and made his own way out. The black curtain flapped in his mouth. But he was too late. The man had gone, and there were three turnings to choose from. He chose instead a telephone box and dialed with an odd sense for him of sanity and decision, 999. It didn't take two minutes to get the right department. They were interested and very kind. Yes, there had been a murder in a muse, Cullen Muse. A man's neck had been cut from ear to ear with a bread knife, a horrid crime. He began to tell them how he had sat next to the murderer in a cinema. It couldn't be anyone else. There was blood on his hands, and he remembered with repulsion as he spoke the damp beard. There must have been a terrible lot of blood. But the voice from the yard interrupted him. No, 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 it was saying. We have the murderer. No doubt of it at all. It's the body that's disappeared. Craven put down the receiver. He said to himself aloud, Why should this happen to me? Why to me? He was back in the horror of his dream. The squalid, darkening street outside was only one of the innumerable tunnels connecting grave to grave where the imperishable bodies lay. He said, It was a dream. <laughs> a dream. And leaning forward, he saw in the mirror above the telephone his own face sprinkled by tiny drops of blood like dew from a scent spray. He began to scream. <laughs> I won't go mad. <laughs> I'm sane. I won't go mad. Presently, a little crowd began to collect, and soon a policeman came. From almost the first moment that I entered the big room clutching my bottle, my attention was riveted upon a girl who was there. 
I say a girl, but in fact she was considerably older than I was, thirty at least, I should suppose. She was very blonde and slender, almost ethereal. She had the greenest eyes I'd ever seen, or have ever seen since, and the biggest too. She wore white boots which went right up under her dress. If this girl worked in my bank, I'd certainly not seen her there. We were never introduced or anything like that, but I simply couldn't bother about anyone else who was there, male or female. I simply gravitated towards and around her. In the end, she said, Hello. You look unhappy. I nodded. That was partly because I was shy and speechless. Come and sit by me, she said, and have a drink. Well, the drink was the usual dreadful stuff that you get at parties where everyone's mucking in, but... Three or four glasses, each of something different, gave me more confidence, and in the end I was conversing with the girl quite intelligently. We had all kinds of things in common, like books and films and concerts, which I used to go in for at that time as much as I could, and in no time at all I was in seventh heaven. It was absolutely the first time in my life that I had entered that region, and as it happens, it was more or less the last time also. The rest of them were making more and more noise until it was exactly like the bank or like the sort of tavern my father used to look for. In the end, my girl said, let's explore. We went upstairs and entered what I suppose was the parents' bedroom. We sat together on the bed. I say, I said, who are you? I'm Laura, she said. She did tell me her other name, but I'm keeping that to myself. She even told me her address and telephone number, and of course I should have written them down, but I supposed them to be burned on my brain forever, as one does at that age. I'm Andrew, I said, and she smiled at me mysteriously. So I put my arm around her shoulders and should have liked to turn out the light, but I knew the door was unlocked and did not dare to go so far as to lock it. She was wearing a thin, greeny dress with a pattern on it like waves. I'd never seen a dress like it, but... Why, it's impossible to describe. Andrew, she said, looking at me with her enormous eyes, I do love you. Oh, let me tell you, it was the supreme moment of my entire life, though I didn't realise that at the time. But then she cried, Andrew, I must go and telephone. I'd quite forgotten. You made me forget. Oh, you, you, you will come back, I gasped out. Of course, it was dangerous for her to leave the room at all. That was obvious enough. Even so, her reply astonished me. I shall always come back, was what she said. She pulled up her boots and flitted out. Laura didn't come back. In the end, it seemed quite certain that she must have heard something on the telephone which had made her leave at once. I did not care to ask anyone. I was downcast enough on the way home, and it became worse when I realised that I'd forgotten both Laura's exact address and her telephone number. However, I knew her name right enough, and I remembered the name of the road she'd given me. Immediately I reached my digs, I looked Laura up in the communal telephone directory and found that the page was missing. It was not that it had been torn out, though the other chaps often did that. I examined the binding, and it seemed that that particular page had never been there. I slept not one wink that night between rapture and regret. But in the end... I left the banking floor, and I was given a more confidential job of toting records from place to place. It was inevitable that I saw more of the world, though I didn't always like what I saw. On several occasions I even thought of marrying, and the different girls seemed quite keen to have me, but each time I drew back at the last moment. Most men value their freedom, of course, but it was really Laura that was the trouble with me. She'd transfix me. I could never get her out of my thoughts. Though you may think this odd, because I believe it was as much as eight or ten years before I saw or heard of her again. I was in Paris and strolling through the Parc Monceau on business, when all among the prams and nursemaids I saw her on a seat. My heart turned over. I was all but sick with the shock. Hello, she said. You look unhappy. I am, I said. It's your fault. You must know that. She smiled in that way which so confused me. In which case, we'll go and have a drink and make it up. Oh, you must be cold. I couldn't help saying it because she was wearing very much the same dress. And the same sort of boots. 
and it was a blustery day in Paris with rain every now and then and worse undoubtedly to come. I've been waiting too, she said reproachfully. She never added much to that. We wandered off across the park to a funny little place in a side street. On the way, though, really it wasn't far, we passed a ghastly street accident, or perhaps it was something worse. I tried not to look at it, and as she said nothing, of course I didn't. We began mixing our drinks again in the same unwise way, and talking about all those things we had in common, though naturally we both went to fewer films and concerts and read fewer books than before, Oh, but that applies to almost everyone. I realised with a little shiver she might well be 40 by now, or at least 38. I can only say that she did not look it. She looked devastating, in a slightly peculiar way. In the end I began eating as well as drinking, though <laughs> she would only nibble. While I was in the middle of one of those hashed-up mock steaks, the patron came up in his red apron and whispered into Laura's ear. She rose instantly. Excusez-moi, she said absent-mindedly, and as if I'd been a Frenchman. Well, she pulled herself together and added, back in a moment, smiling her smile. Then before I could get out a word, she walked quickly out of the café. Oh, yes, this time I tore right after her, but the patron clutched at me and held me back by brute force. I suppose he was frightened for his bill, but alternatively it might have been that he knew something I didn't. I mooched miserably about in the chilly drizzle for, I dare say, an hour and a half, trying to keep the cafe entrance under observation, but I knew in my bones that Laura would not return. Not there, anyway. Not then. Within only a couple of years, I got down at last to proposing marriage, and Cecilia Susan accepted me at once. I was perfectly determined to work in the marriage, and obviously it was only fair that I should, but Laura stood more hopelessly in the light than I had supposed possible. I never said a word about her to Cecilia Susan. It would have sounded so utterly unrealistic. Nor were things helped by the fact that our two children, only a year apart actually, died in an accident at the nursery school. I'm sure you heard about it, or read about it at the time. There were questions in Parliament and a big inquiry, of which we both gave evidence. In the end, Cecilia Susan left me for a more practical chap ten years younger than I was, and eight years younger than she was. There was a quick divorce, and I've never seen or heard of Cecilia Susan since. All this time, I was working for these new people, having left the bank soon after the Parc Monceau business. It's a funny sort of job, but it pays a lot better, and it's occasionally quite exciting. There was a meeting at a big hotel near... Well, I won't name it. It was in the north of Italy. Now, <laughs> that'll give you the picture. Not actually in the town either, as I say. The gathering was international, cosmopolitan, all those things. And believe me, it was pretty tense. By then, I was accustomed to almost anything. But suddenly, I'd had enough, and I went out for a breather. I hate a pet room. I went downstairs, and there at a table in the lounge sat Laura. She was looking out through the big window at all the snow and ice and tempest. I did not say that she was dressed in exactly the same way, not at all, but it was a version of the same garb in every detail, and she looked, well, ageless might be the best word. I stood back. I was petrified. It had been a terrible afternoon upstairs, if I'm to be honest about it, and now here in the dusk was this. In the end, Laura turned and saw me. You do look unhappy, she said. Come and sit by me. Well, I could hardly cut and run. In any case, we are all virtually snowed up. But needless to say, I did not want to do anything of the kind. Calm judgment was useless where Laura was concerned. I find it almost always is useless. She filled a glass from a big decanter of red wine. It was as if the glass had been set there for me and waiting. Wine of oblivion, said Laura, smiling. At least this time, we seem not to propose mixing them, and inevitably, by now, we no longer read books at all or bothered ourselves with films and, and concerts or anything like that. How long are you staying, I asked, with one part of my mind still on the drifting snow. It doesn't matter, said Laura. There will be future occasions. I laughed, and everyone in the lounge looked up, except for the very old and the very deaf. 
The intervals are a bit on the long side, I said. One day there won't be a second to spare, she replied in a matter-of-fact way. I expect I stared at her like a fool. Now, if you like, she said. Well, I suppose I continued to stare. In my work I'd become ready with conventional words, but only with those. Come and see, she said, with that all-dissolving smile of hers. Do you mind carrying the wine? I followed her upstairs, back upstairs where I was concerned. In the conference room there seemed to be total silence, which was absurd and impossible. She wove in and out on the first floor of the hotel, then pushed open a dingy and ill-painted door, not up to the general standard of the place, and held it for me to pass through with the big decanter in one hand and the two big wine glasses slipping about in the other. Beyond was a very big corridor, ill-lighted and with battered bedroom doors on either side. There were holes in the carpet and big cracks in the plaster of the ceiling through which things might emerge when most people had gone to bed. One could not help thinking of that. Plainly it was a wing which had been virtually closed, and not only for the off-season, one would suggest. I marvelled that Laura should, as I presume, sleep there and dwell there. Before long I was unable to reconcile so long a corridor with the outside of the building, as I'd glimpsed it for a moment on arrival. On and on and on I tramped after her, tripping over the ragged carpet, coping with my slithery burdens. She opened a door to our left. I felt immediately that it might have been any door. She stood at the portal, smiling. Really, she was much too lightly clad for the dreadful chill of that corridor, where the central heating had been so long turned off. In her wavy dress, she looked more like the sea in summer, though deep and mighty. <laughs> but you wouldn't possibly understand what I mean. You would have had to be there. One day, perhaps, you will be. I could only just see into the room. By the few glimmering lights in the corridor, totally insufficient for modern hotel visitors, I could discern in the room only rotting woodwork and huge worms and soiled rags on the floor. Come in and have a drink with me, bad Laura. Then I can look after you properly. After a second or two of silence between us, she gently added, You might call me your guardian angel. No one should think I made a fool of myself. Not at all. I'd been very fully trained in self-control. I set down the heavy decanter on the threshold, and though one of the glasses fell from my hand as I stooped, it did not shatter. I by no means broke into a panicky rush, but at the most what my late father, who came very much into my mind at that moment, would have called a fast jog-trot, which sufficed perfectly well, though I don't know what might have happened if by mistake I had run in the wrong direction. Naturally, I've not again seen Laura as yet. I keep telling myself to stop worrying, because such things are not decided by us, but for us. The road begins to rise in a series of gentle curves, passing through pleasing groves of olive and vines. Five kilometres on the left is the fork for Florence. To the right may be seen the Tower of Sacrifice, 470 steps, built in 1535 by Niccolò de Ferramano. Superstitious fear left the tower intact when in 1549 the surrounding village was completely destroyed. Triumphantly, Caroline lifted her finger from the fine italic type. There was nothing to mar the success of this afternoon. For the first time, she had taken the Italian guidebook Neville was always urging on her, and hesitatingly, haltingly, she had managed to piece out enough of the language to choose a route that took in four well-thought-of frescoes, two universally admired campanilis, and one wooden crucifix in a village church quite a long way from the main road. It was not, after all, such a bad thing that a British council meeting had kept Neville in Florence. Perhaps there would just be time to add this tower to her dutiful collection. What was it called? She bent to the guidebook again, carefully tracing the text with her finger to be sure she was translating it correctly word by word. But this time her moving finger stopped abruptly at the name of Niccolo de Ferramano. There had risen in her mind a picture. No, no, not a picture, a portrait 
of a thin white face with deep-set eyes that stared intently into hers. Why a portrait, she asked. And then she remembered. It had been about three months ago, just after they were married, when Neville had first brought her to Florence. He himself had already lived there for two years, and during that time had been at least as concerned to accumulate Tuscan culture for himself as to disseminate English culture to the Italians. She had been proud to accompany Neville to castles and palaces privately owned to which his work gave him entry, and there to gaze with what she hoped was pleasure on the undiscovered Raphael, the Titian that had hung on the same wall ever since it was painted, the Giotto fresco under which the family that had originally commissioned it still said their prayers. It had been on one of these pilgrimages that she had seen the face of the young man with the black eyes. In a castle at the top of a hill, she had followed Neville dutifully along a gallery lined with five centuries of family portraits, listening politely while, in his light, well-bred voice, he had told her some intimate anecdotes of history. And, involuntarily, she had let her eyes wander round the room. It was thus that her eye was caught by a face on the other side, and forgetting what was due to politeness, she caught her husband's arm and demanded, Neville, who's that girl over there? But he was pleased with her. He said, Ah, I'm glad you picked that one out. It's generally thought to be the best thing in the collection. A bronzino, of course. And they went over to have a look at it. The picture was painted in rich pale colours, a green curtain, a blue dress, a young face with calm brown eyes under plaits of honeycomb hair. Caroline read out the name under the picture. Giovanni de Ferramano, 1531 to 1549. That was the year the village was destroyed, she remembered now, sitting in the car by the roadside. But then she had exclaimed, Neville, she was only 18 when she died. Oh, they married young in those days, Neville commented, and Caroline said in surprise, Oh, was she married? It had been the radiantly virginal character of the face that had caught her inattention. Yes, she was married, Neville answered, and added, look, look at the portrait beside her. And this was when Caroline had seen the pale young man. There were no clear light colours in this picture. There was only the whiteness of the face, the blackness of the eyes, the hair, the clothes, and the glint of gold letters on the pile of books, on which the young man rested his hand. Underneath this picture was written, Portrait of an Unknown Gentleman. Do you mean he's her husband? Surely they'd know if he was, instead of calling him an unknown gentleman. Oh, he's Niccolo de Ferramano, all right. I've seen another portrait of him somewhere, and it's not a face one would forget. But there's apparently some queer scandal about him. And though they don't turn his picture out, they won't mention his name. Last time I was here, the old count himself took me through the gallery. I asked him about little Giovanna and her husband. It was horribly clear that I shouldn't have asked. He said... Either, oh, she was lost or she was damned, but which word it was, I can never be sure. The portrait of Nicola he just ignored altogether. What was wrong with Nicola, I wonder? Oh, I don't know, but I can guess. Do you notice the lettering on those books up there under his hand? It's all in Hebrew or Arabic. Undoubtedly, the unmentionable Nicola dabbled in black magic. Caroline shivered. I don't like him, she said. Let's look at Giovanna again. And they'd moved back to the first portrait, and Neville had said casually, Do you know, she's rather like you. Caroline put the guidebook back in the pigeonhole under the dashboard and drove carefully along the gentle curves until she came to the fork for Florence on the left. On the top of a little hill to the right stood a tall, round tower. There was no other building in sight. Caroline knew that she wanted to take the fork to the left, to Florence and home and Neville and, said an urgent voice inside her, for safety. This voice so much shocked her that she got out of the car and began to trudge up the dusty track towards the tower. The tower was built of narrow red bricks, and only thin slits pierced its surface, right at the top where Caroline could see some kind of narrow platform encircling it. Before her was an arched doorway. I'm just going to have a quick look, she assured herself again. And then she walked in. She was in an empty room with a low arch ceiling. A narrow stone staircase clung to the wall and circled round the room to disappear through a hole in the ceiling. There ought to be a wonderful view at the top, said Caroline firmly to herself, and she laid her hand on the rusty rail and started to climb, and as she climbed she counted. Thirty-nine, forty, 
41, she said. And with the forty-first step, she came through the ceiling and saw over her head, far, far above, the deep blue evening sky, a small circle of blue framed in a narrowing shaft round which the narrow staircase spiralled. There was no inner wall. Only the rusty railing protected the climber on the inside. It's getting dark very quickly, said Caroline, at the hundred and fiftieth step. I know what the tower is like now. It would be much more sensible to give up and go home. At the two hundred and sixty-ninth step, her hand moving forward on the railing made only empty space. For an interminable second she shivered, pressing back to the hard brick on the other side. Then, hesitatingly, she groped forwards, upwards, and at last her fingers met the rusty rail again, and again she climbed. At the 375th step, the rail, as her moving hand clutched it, crumbled away under her fingers. I'd better just go by the wall, she told herself, and now her left hand traced the rough brick as she climbed up and up. 422, 423, counted Caroline with part of her brain. I really ought to go down now, said another part. I wish, oh, I want to go down now. But she could not. It would be silly to give up, she told herself, desperately trying to rationalize what drove her on, just because one's afraid. And then she had to stifle that thought, too. And there was nothing left in her brain but the steadily mounting tally of the steps. Four hundred and seventy, said Caroline aloud. And then she stopped abruptly, because the steps had stopped too. There was nothing ahead but a piece of broken railing barring her way, and the sky drained now of all its colour was still some twenty feet above her head. But how idiotic, she said to the air. The whole thing's absolutely pointless. And then the fingers of her left hand, exploring the wall beside her, meant not brick, but wood. She turned to see what it was, and there in the wall, level with the top step, was a small wooden door. So it does go somewhere after all, she said, and she fumbled with a rusty handle. The door pushed open, and she stepped through. She was on a narrow stone platform about a yard wide. It seemed to encircle the tower. The platform sloped downwards away from the tower, and its stones were smooth and very shiny. And this was all she noticed before she looked beyond the stones and down. She was immeasurably, unbelievably high and alone, and the ground below was a world away. It was not credible, not possible, that she should be so far from the ground. All her being was suddenly absorbed in the single impulse to hurl herself from the sloping platform. I cannot go down any other way, she said. And then she heard what she said and stepped back, frenziedly clutching the soft rotten wood of the doorway with hands sodden with sweat. There is no other way, said the voice in her brain. There is no other way. This is vertigo, said Caroline. I've never had it before, but I know what it is, and it's vertigo. She closed her eyes and kept very still, and felt the cold sweat running down her body. I shall be all right now, she said at last, and carefully she stepped back through the doorway, on to the 470th step, and pulled the door shut before her. She looked up at the sky, swiftly darkening with night. Then, for the first time, she looked down into the shaft of the tower, down to the narrow, unprotected staircase, spiralling round and round and round and round, and disappearing into the dark. She said, she screamed, I can't go down. She began to cry, shuddering with the pain of her sobs. It could not be true that she had brought herself to this peril, that there could be no safety for her unless she could climb down the menacing stairs. At last she stopped crying and said, Now I shall go down. One, she counted, and her right hand tearing at the brick wall, she moved first one and then the other foot down to the second step. Two, she counted, and then she thought of the depth below her and stood still, stupefied with terror. 
The stone beneath her feet, the brick against her hand, were two frail protections for her exposed body. They could not save her from the voice that repeated that it would be easier to fall. Abruptly, she sat down on the step. Two, she counted again, and spreading both her hands tightly against the step on each side of her, she swung her body off the second step, down onto the third. Three, she counted, then four, then five, pressing closer and closer into the wall, away from the empty drop on the other side. At the twenty-first step, she said, I think I can do it now. She slid her right hand up the rough wall and slowly stood upright. Then with the other hand, she reached for the railing. It was now too dark to see, but it was not there. For timeless time she stood there knowing nothing but fear. Twenty-one, she said. Twenty-one, twenty-one. Over and over again, but she could not step onto the twenty-second step. Something brushed her face. She knew it was a bat and not a hand that touched her, but still it was horror beyond conceivable horror. And it was this horror, without any sense of moving from dread to safety, that at last impelled her down the stairs. Twenty-three! Twenty-four! Twenty-five! She counted, and around her the air was full of whispering skin-stretched wings. If one of them should touch her again, she must fall. Twenty-six! Twenty-seven! Twenty-eight! The skin of her right hand was torn and hot with blood, for she would never lift it from the wall, only press it slowly down and force her rigid legs to move from the knowledge of each step to the peril of the next. So Caroline came down the dark tower. She could not think. She could know nothing but fear. Only her brain remorselessly recorded the tally. Five hundred and one, it counted. Five hundred and two, and three, and four, and five.